Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you, and thanks for joining us online as well as we continue in our series in Mark. And with the rain outside, you got nowhere to be. So uh, we're, we'll be good to be in the Word of God today. We'll be in chapter 10 of the Gospel. You know, I got a picture here um, that's very dear to me. And uh, it's a picture that I put in my office, and I don't have it in a frame or anything. It's just real, just this nice photo, and I keep this in my office um, because I was commanded to by one of our deacons when I became a lead pastor, and then second, I was inspired to by a, a president of a college who talked to me about Uh, pastoral ministry. You might want to guess what this picture is of, but the person in this picture bears my last name because I asked her to, and she said yes. I remember the first time I laid eyes on her. I was dating another girl at the time. (laughs) Don't, don't, Judge me, she was dating another guy. It was our freshman year, and everyone knew that this Rebecca girl was a former state gymnast. She was the top five vote getter in my dorm for girls you'd like to date, and a homecoming, we all the above, and she walked with a certain swagger, and I'm even in trouble just sharing this much about her this morning. And um, our sophomore year, God had put in her, if you will, like a new heart. She had gone on a missions trip and she came back. And this somewhat rebellious girl who was forced to go to the college I was at by her father out of fear for her future, um, who was known for getting demerits for her lack of modesty, this girl... had someone communicate to me that she liked me. I had a sense or a feeling, because the guys of my dorm were like, you loser, she likes you. They weren't very happy about this, I think, because they all liked her, but they go, are you, what are you going to do? I said, I'm not sure. They go, why does she like you? And I said, I have some ideas, guys, geez. I was on the basketball team, and I was one of the guards, and she was on the cheerleading team, so we were this little Jack and Diane story. And and, and, uh, she would travel, and I would try to make eye contact with her, and I tried to to things, but she was very standoffish. But I remember one day, um, one of her friends affirmed me. She would be liking me to talk to her. I couldn't text her. I didn't have that option, okay? My phone didn't even flip at that point, right? So, so I had to figure out a way to do this. And so I had been working at the college on, uh, we were pu- installing light posts. So I had a post hole digger and I was making holes at the college. And I thought, I'll, I'll ask her to go on a walk, and this really sounded good at the time. Ladies, I really thought this sounded good. I was like, I'll take her to see that hole. <laughs> see how I reeled her in like that? And so I went to her dorm, knocked on the door, said, hey, is Rebecca there? And everybody's like, <laughs> Chris is here, Chris is here. She comes. So I, I took her on a walk and I took her to the hole I dug. And that was, that's, that's the hole I dug right there today. Where, you, uh, would you be interested in going to homecoming with me? <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Great. I mean, great. Great. When is it? It's next weekend. Yeah, okay, great. And I'm like feeling good about myself. I mean, in a small college, word's getting around. Rebecca and Chris are going homecoming together. I feel pretty good. I walk up to her, kind of feeling myself a little bit later that night. She was at, with a bunch of her friends at the volleyball court. She had a hat on. And I walked up, and I kind of squeezed the bill of her hat. And I'm like, hey, Becca, like, I'm, I, like I can do that now. And she goes, oh, whoa, don't ever touch my hat again. <laughs> and I fell in love in that moment. She was known for never missing a photo booth. We didn't have cell phones, young people, so we had trouble getting pictures of ourselves because we had to do these Polaroid or 
Kodak things and wait for it to be developed. And so photo booths were awesome, especially for the girls. And Rebecca would take these, and you know, she still has kept these. And, and we were big old nerds, and I, I snuck this. I'm probably gonna be in trouble, okay? But I snuck some of these pictures from this. Um, th- this is us dating. And I, and I show this because I did have hair at one point. <laughs> and, and the other is um, some of the teenagers right now feel lied to. They go, we never knew you had hair, Chris. And, and so I'm like, but Becca loved to get our picture. And we have so many of those. And she kept all of them. And in November, back in the 1900s, <laughs> Becca and I started dating. We fell in love. We wanted to get married. And... During marital counseling, or pre-marital counseling, um, I had some awesome counselors in my life. I had some really cool pastors, some people that really mean a lot to me. In fact, Pastor Gabe, who does worship here, his father is one of my pastoral heroes and, and just like who you look to about how to be a dad. And he was our, our counselor as well as Rebecca's pastor, and they gave us so much good stuff. But one thing I remember that I keep by this picture is my bride, not, not, not the mom, but just her in this car. And I think about this image that I was taught during pre or counseling that I still use with every couple. And so if I married you in here, and I've married a lot of people in here or in the first service, you've heard me talk about this illustration and it's the triangle. Our counselor drew a triangle Becca and I, I brand everything. I brand everything. I branded our relationship, us. And so every cassette tape I made of her with all our journey songs and all that different stuff, us was on the front, us, us, us. And he took that us and they said, let me help you out though. There's gonna be a divine aspect to this marriage if it's a biblical marriage. We got Chris, the husband. We got Rebecca, the wife. But what you're asking is Jesus to be the center of this marriage. Do you desire to have Jesus be the center of this marriage? Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay, well then that, what that means is you gotta do marriage the way Jesus says to do it. Oh yeah, absolutely. There'll never be a problem, right? That's why every young girl, oh, it's just, well, he's so cute. <laughs> oh, she's so wonderful. <laughs> it, they're so cute at that age, right? But guess what? God has blessed me with that type of relationship with my wife. And a lot has to do with that triangle because something that one of my mentors said spoke to me. He said, Chris, watch this, watch this. As you grow closer to God, look at the triangle. Who do you naturally grow closer to? As Rebecca grows closer to God, who does she naturally grow closer to? So, so, before you think this is all, I got to fix her. I've got to change her. If she's this, when you go through struggles, I want you to remember, Chris, as you grow closer to what Jesus wants for you, as you look into scripture as what Jesus asks of you as a husband, you will naturally grow closer to her. The opposite's true. The further you get away from what Jesus asks you to do in marriage, the further Rebecca gets away from what Jesus asks you to do in marriage, the further you'll get away from one another. One of my mentors, his name was Warren. He said, I want a picture in your office, Chris, of your wife, just her. You keep it there and you rejoice always in the wife of your youth. And so I have this picture in my office on command from wisdom around me. But at the same time, it reminds me that Rebecca and I made a promise before God to be joined together. And that is the title of our sermon today, Joined Together. We're gonna see what Jesus says about this joining. It's found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, one through 16. The disciples are gonna ask Jesus today about the subject of divorce. 41% of Americans have experienced a divorce. 37% of Christians have experienced 
a divorce. So in this room, there are people, and watching online, there are people that understand and have firsthand experience on the subject of divorce. In fact, in preparation of this sermon, just to gain more insight into this, because some of my closest friends and even some of my most dear friends have gone through divorce, as well as some very dear members in our church that I I love and cherish, I asked them to come over or get together with me in the weeks leading up this message and say, give me some extra insight into what you experienced. What were some of the things you went through? Because as a pastor, I understand the many dynamics of it because much like a police officer, a pastor gets to see people at their very worst. And so I have some very dark illustrations and very sad and disturbing and hurtful things that I've seen happen in marriages. And I also know the enemy has targeted them for it's designed by God. And therefore I know the world has a very different view on marriage than what scripture says. But you come to Renew Bible to hear what the Bible says, not what your friend down the street says or what the TV says. We wanna hear from God's word. But in doing so, some trending things. People suffer with shame and blame. They spend their lives blaming someone or they spend their lives feeling shameful for what they could have done or did or didn't do. Some trending things were fear for the children who would go through this, that they would walk away from the things of God, that the children would never desire marriage for how awful theirs was or for some of the horrible things that have happened to children as homes have become toxic. Another thing was labeled. Another trending thing was labeled. Folks that have gone through this feel like it's a label on them for the rest of their lives. And another trending theme was how hard life is. Holidays are hard. Weekends, taking children around, doing different things, tensions that are surrounding it. So much pain. And in listening to their hearts and gaining some more empathy, because I wanted to preach this sermon much like last week, and Jesus is not giving me any breaks in the pulpit right now. But we want to preach the truth, but we want to preach the truth with a tear in our eye. For anybody who's gone through this, has some tremendous wounds. And my goal today is not to rip wounds open so you can relax. In fact, I hope to pour a bunch of grace but I also don't want to avoid what Jesus says about it and how Jesus feels about it because I don't particularly like to take advice from another source over my heavenly father and my wonderful savior. And I believe that's why you frequent this place as well. So let's be true to that. Let's ask the scripture to speak today and let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to humble our hearts to hear this message And I hope inspire all ages, whether they're about to get married out there considering marriage, but also those who might be tuning in today alone with a spouse that's not talking to them or they feel threatened by. I wanna talk to anybody here today, not from my words, but from Jesus, because he speaks on this subject, but you'll be surprised at the angle he takes. Heavenly Father, use this text today to confront, to inspire, to encourage, and possibly even renew our hearts towards the ones that we love, even those at times that maybe we don't like, even those that hurt us, even those that need proper boundaries away from us, but even those we never thought it would happen. Lord, give us some teaching today that we can apply to our lives. So I would ask that you would remove the room of distraction so that we can concentrate on what your word has to say. I would ask, Lord, that you would humble the hearts that are listening both in this house and online, that we might receive your word and seek to apply it to our lives. 
And Lord, I pray that we would leave differently because we visited this place and sat under the word of God, specifically today in the gospel of Mark. We pray these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. All right, Mark chapter 10, Jesus is on the move towards Jerusalem. And he left there and he went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And the Pharisees came up in order to test him. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. What's going on here? A question's been asked, is it lawful? And I noted three things in just that short section. One, did you note they came to him to ask the question to do what? To test him. Test him? It's as if they knew his position on divorce and it's as if they knew his answer could work in their favor as his enemies. What's the background? Scripture had taught in the Old Testament, which they had at their disposal, that divorce would be done in certain aspects, specifically a passage in Deuteronomy 24. Do you know what it says? It says this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, of, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord and you shall not bring sin upon the land of the Lord. Your God is giving you for an inheritance. Huh? <laughs> right, church? Wh what? You ever read, Pat, like, what, what just happened there? I'm like, wait, mate, one, this girl's having a horrible day, right? Two, I don't even quite get, people are dying, like indecency, what's going on? And, and so here's the debate. And this is why it was a test. It was a political challenge for Jesus. You wonder why? You remember John the Baptist was beheaded? Do you remember why he was beheaded? He confronted Herod about his divorce and Herod had him killed. So Jesus's position on divorce could possibly get him in trouble with Herod and get him killed. So there's a political test, but there's also a theological test. There was a debate going on during this time about what Moses said. And so did you know that Jesus says, what did Moses command? That was the second thing I noticed. Well, what did Moses command? Well, I just read that. And here was the debate. There were two sides of the argument. There were the conservative rabbis and then there were the liberal rabbis. You say, what? I thought that was more like 2023. No, no, no. This has been going on forever. This isn't new. You didn't arrive upon this. Now the conservative rabbis, they held the position that when Moses says, because he has found some indecency, that this is some sort of sexual immorality and therefore that's the only grounds. 
sexual immorality. Well, the liberals from the Hillel school, they said, oh no, this is an indecency. Anything the husband doesn't like embarrasses him, disgraces him. In fact, cooks a meal he might not like could be grounds. Why? Because they were looking for reasons to get divorces. No matter what generation you're in, there are people that open the word of God looking for reasons to get a divorce. And at that time period, you had two trains of thought. And on this subject, I can find you a pulpit or a pastor or a counselor who will tell you whatever you want to hear. And so Jesus says, knowing that there's lots of opinions on divorce, what does Moses say? Well, Moses said this, and Jesus turns and says, yeah, I know why he said that. Why did he say that? So we could do it? He said it because of the hardness of your heart. You can almost hear in Jesus' inflection here a divine concession that, yeah, somebody's going to get prideful, somebody's going to get hard into the other, somebody's heart's going to grow ice cold, somebody's going to betray someone, somebody because those things happen. That's why Moses did it. That's not the way it was supposed to be. In fact, the original design of marriage is beautiful and it's wonderful and it's everything that young couple comes stumbling into premarital counseling, dreaming it would be. But we bring so many factors into that that creates so much confusion. And Jesus doesn't really want to talk about how to make it lawful. He wants to talk about what it is because immediately that's what he says. Jesus says, but from the beginning of creation, this is how I started the Institute of Marriage. It wasn't started by Pennsylvania. It wasn't started by the United States or Australia. It wasn't started by Russia. It wasn't started by Mexico. I instituted marriage. I'm the one who did it. And from the beginning, God made them male and female. This is what marriage looks like. And on top of that, a man then should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Oh, he's got this beautiful picture of holding fast. And the two, the two will become one flesh so that they're no longer two, but one flesh. And then Jesus continues. These are the words of Jesus. He says, and what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus, when being pressed on the subject of divorce, says, do you know what the original design was? God's design began back in the garden. Have you ever read the phrase, for this cause? And processed, what's he speaking about? For this cause. See, back in the garden, God went into the sand, if you will, and out of the sand, I'm gonna use a rope here, he, he created Adam. The first man, and he said, Adam, I want you to, to go and name the animals. And he has dominion over the garden. And he said, go, Adam, go. And he watched Adam and he, and he was walked with Adam and he was close with Adam. And Adam was close, so close with God. But God saw something. And he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And all the ladies would agree with that, yeah. It's not good for man to be alone. And so he put Adam to sleep, scripture says. And, and, he, and he took Adam and from Adam, he pulled his rib out and made Eve. This is in the same Bible you read about Jesus dying and rising again. Same book. And now he has two flesh in front of him. And God goes, this is gonna be beautiful. I'm going to, for this cause, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother for the rest of time. And, and, and she will too. And they'll be joined back together. God had a beautiful design. It's as if they would 
tie the knot. And now two is how many flesh? One flesh. And now, now they'll do life together. It's not good for him to be alone. It's not good for her to be alone. They'll do life together. They'll live together. They'll sleep together. They'll talk together. They'll laugh together. They'll share memories together. They'll make decisions together. They'll do life together. And I can tell you right now, if I'm the devil, I want them to make decisions apart. I want them to live apart. I want them to be apart as much as possible because God's design is that they would be together, serving one another, caring for one another, loving one another. But, but here's where the illustration, it grows. God's design was for them to hold fast. I, 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 got, I got with me, I gotta do this. I got with me, my, I, I do a lot of weddings, okay? And so um, I've got with me my wedding template right here. So this is what I use up front, okay? Now, they're standing there, everybody's all excited, everybody looks good, everybody's dressed to the nines, and I start out the ceremony like this. It would be wrong for me to point out that this is more than just a ceremony. It is a time of worship and praise to our God. This is literally what I say. For it was he who instituted this estate as a picture of the relationship between the church and its savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's not to be entered into lightly, but reverently and discreetly, advisedly, and in the fear of God. And you know what everyone hears? Wah, 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 wah. Oh, my dress looks good. Oh, don't faint, don't faint. Okay, I can't believe mom is wearing that. Okay, that's all that's going on. And I'm reading to them the illustration that I know God is about to authorize in heaven in front of all these witnesses. And so I'm saying things like discreetly, but this world has made marriage almost like this. And I'm going, guys, I gotta tell you, this is big deal. And then the vows and rings come. Oh, and everybody's excited. I said, does anybody, do we have the rings? And the grooms was like, what? I don't even know where they're at. You know, and everybody's laughing. But I say this. It's essential that I remind you of the seriousness of the vows you're about to take. Each one of you is offering yourself unconditionally to the other, no matter what the trials lie ahead. These vows of faithful love are said before God and all present, voiced out loud as evidence of your commitment to each other. And then I said, first time ever, I said, Matt and Katie. I remember saying Kyle and Shauna, Nate, Jess, Ben, Kristen, Kyle, Kelsey, Alex, Amarin, Jared, Liana, Kenton, Natalie, Darren, Emily, Doug, and Lisa, Adam and Corey, Bob and Hilda, Zach and Alex, Ryan and Brittany, Adam and Kana, and Bobby and Maddie. Will you have this woman to be your wedded wife? And each one of them in premarital counseling with me, and everybody knows me, I make them say, will you promise to stay with her? Look at me. Dude, you gonna hold me accountable, Pastor Chris? Yeah, because I'm marrying you. Will you promise to have this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in this holy estate of matrimony? This is God's illustration. Will you love her and comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health and forsaking all others, keep only to her so long as you both shall live and you wouldn't believe they do it. They do it. They go, I do, I do. Or they say, I will, something like that. And it's awesome and I just love looking in their eyes. And then I tell them, I say, okay guys, you have both chosen to seal your vows by the giving and receiving of ranks. I'm reading my, my, my wedding. Okay, those small in size, and although you lose them sometimes, and this is not my second, it is my third. <laughs> those small in size, these rings are very large in significance. Made in precious metal, they remind us that love is neither cheap nor common, and it may cost you. Made in a circle, their design tells us that love must never end, and we must keep it continuous. 
As you wear these rings, whether together or apart for just a moment, may they be constant reminders of these promises you're making today. For as the scripture says, let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. I remember the pastor saying, Rebecca, repeat after me. This ring is a sign of my love and faithfulness. And my lovely wife said, this sign is a ring of my love and faithfulness. And I'm, wait, wait, wait. We're so nervous on those days. But a pastor who desires and has a very high view of marriage will go out of his way to remind this couple that you are making a promise and you are walking into an illustration that the God of the universe began in the garden. And what you're doing today is not just a neat romantic thing for really cool pictures and the photographers there and all your friends there. You're doing something before God and what you bind on earth before witnesses, you bind in heaven. And then I pronounce them man and wife and they're joined together. And Paul says, that's the mystery. What, what, what's a mystery? A mystery, I like that. What's a mystery? Here's the mystery. God says when biblical marriage happens, he was involved. And he was a part of joining the couple together. This is not just the two of you. There is a divine entity to this. And on top of that, Paul says, it's a picture of Jesus' love for his church. Yeah, Jesus is the groom and the church, the body of Christ, not a building, is the bride and he's coming for her. And he made a promise to her. And Jesus is a groom who keeps his promise. If your little children come running up to you and say, daddy, tell me what it means that Jesus loves the church. The greatest thing a daddy could do is go, hey mom, come here. The kids wanna hear an illustration about Jesus's love for the church. Come here, let's show them. Because Jesus is in the center of this triangle, if you will. And the closer we grow to him, the closer we grow to one another. He holds us and he holds this and it's bound in heaven and as on earth. And Jesus's opinion on the subject is don't let men separate this. This is a beautiful illustration. Now, if I'm the devil and I wanna wreck an illustration that Jesus says loves the church, where would I go after? I'm going after the illustration. I'm going after marriages. See, something beautiful and wonderful has happened. And that's where you begin to realize that the world's idea of marriage is off. They look at marriage as something they do to be happy. But that is a pagan view of marriage. I love what Gary Chapman says in one of the best books you can read, by the way, about marriage. It's called Sacred Marriage. He says this, marriage wasn't designed to make you happy. It was designed to make you holy. You were to learn how to love one another, bear with one another, encourage one another, be patient with one another, be kind to one another, honor one another. This was the greatest one another that there could possibly be. It was designed to grow you in holiness, but if you think it was to make you happy, heaven forbid we're not happy, and the marriage breaks down, and the illustration breaks down. Jesus just stops. Oh, come on, come on, we need more Jesus. He just stops talking about it. And they go on their way. And then the disciples, they stop them and say, hey, we're, we're in the middle of this illustration here. Can we, can we ask some more questions about divorce and remarriage, please? And, 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 he, and he just keeps going. And the scripture says this, in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, all right, here's some more. Whoever divorces his wife 
and marries another, commits adultery against her. And then he continues and says, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Watch this, watch this. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them and the disciples rebuked him. Can you picture this image? Wait, 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 Jesus, what did you just say? If a man divorces his wife, that adult, wait, wait, and wait, 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 wait. Did you just say if a woman divorces a man? That's not in the law. Here, here's some more information. In Jewish law, a woman could not divorce the man. It was only the man who could divorce the woman. Jesus elevates women and says, yeah, and if she divorces him, what? They're like, they're like recoiling from this. Jesus, I mean, he, he is not into being politically correct, is he? And he throws them scenarios and they're recoiling from this. And all of a sudden, Mark says, children start running in the room. And you can preach, yeah, we're having an adult conversation. Yeah, yeah. And watch what Jesus does. And when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of God. I'm, I can't do indignant good enough because he is furious they tried to stop him. This is right up there with get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, don't you dare tell those children not to come to me. But we were talking about divorce. Yeah, and I want to talk about that. I want to talk about these kids. Come here, guys, come here. Isn't it interesting in the Mark and account, in speaking about divorce, he goes out of his way to talk about Jesus going, if you ever feel rejected, if you ever feel abandoned, you come here, you come here. Isn't that unbelievable where that's compartmentalized? And it's part of the parochopy. And so we see that Mark and Count is doing this intentionally. And Jesus sees what happens to children. And he cares deeply. And guess what? He cares just as much for that husband who's going through it, who is his kid, and that wife who's going through it, who is his daughter. He cares deeply. And all they want to talk about is, is it lawful? Can we do it? How do we do it? I've noticed something. You can't spell lawful without the words awful. And that's how Jesus views this. It's as if a boss comes into a staff meeting and goes, all right, everybody, 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 we want honesty in this organization. I want everybody to be honest with one another. Do not lie to one another, okay? Be honest with one another. Lying is gonna break everything down. It's gonna hurt him. It's gonna hurt her. Lying is gonna make us not trust you. It's gonna knock down productivity. Lying is so bad. Don't lie. Yes, question in the back. Okay, if I lie, can I lie this way? <sighs> yeah, like what if she lies to me and I don't like if that she lied to me? Can I do this? Okay, because of the hardness of your, okay, because you're going to lie anyway, here's some instruction. Because you have to remember, God's very clear on the subject. Scripture says in Malachi that God hates divorce. I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. You remember that Israel was so adulterous metaphorically with God. They would sleep around with other nations. He would call them a prostitute at times, sleeping around and betraying him, the one true God. And he would say, return to me. And he would give her second chances. You can see God working through this, but he hates divorce. And I want to remind you something, church, because there are awful people at times who will take things and shame people. They're acting awfully. We're all awful. And they'll say things like, God hates divorce. It does not say he hates divorced people. It doesn't say that anywhere. In fact, God loves you. For God sent his son that whoever believes in him should not perish. That's how much God loves the world. And the way people have weaponized scripture at times for people who've gone through some of the most painful things on earth. Grace even abounds there. 
But I can tell you one of the reasons I believe God hates divorce. When God says don't do something in scripture, young people get this early in life. He's not trying to rue your fun. He's not like following Chris Heller around at 18 going, that looks fun. Uh, oh, 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 he's having fun with her. All right, that's not God. Okay, and I used to think that. I'd be like, okay, what can I get away with in here? And there's still people to this day, they look at the Bible and it's like, what can we get away with? I mean, there's a lot of things I can't do, but what can I get away with? I don't see anything there about that. God's going, no, no, no. When I tell you don't do something, don't hurt yourself. When I say I hate divorce, I hate what it does to my kids. I hate what happens to people. I hate what the ramifications of it. I've had to listen to people share stories of my wife was selling her body online and I didn't even know it and now all my friends saw her. I've listened to women say he slept around with four other guys and one of them was my best friend. My life, been so hurt. I've heard people share stories I've heard teenagers say, I would be up in my room and I'd just turn my music on and shut the door because I can't handle the screaming anymore, Pastor Chris. I couldn't handle it anymore. I prayed every day. Mommy and daddy wouldn't. And I don't want anything to do with church anymore. I heard all the stories. There's so much hurt. And that's where I, I can tend. I can, be, I can watch myself. I, get a little, I can get a little hay fever up here on this subject because I have so many close friends and people I truly love that have been through this. And there's so many dynamics to it. I couldn't possibly coach you through all the dynamics, nor could our church. We could try to help, but there's so many dynamics, including people who are in wicked danger. People who have had mental health struggles and totally have changed in the marriage. Like, wh where did she go? Where did he go? Like after that tragedy, they were never the same. After that happened, it was never the same. We hear all these stories. Jesus, because he knows there'll be hardness of heart on at least one party, if not both, and anybody who has been through a divorce shared with me that they never felt like they couldn't have done more themselves. Very seldom do you find in a couple someone who says, I did absolutely nothing, even though there does seem to be cases like that. But Jesus says, if there's no other way and reconciliation is clearly not possible and the person is woefully unwilling to even consider reconciling, then in the case of adultery, I say to you in Matthew, he adds, that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And the second exception is abandonment of an unbelieving spouse. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. But could I possibly encourage you before you take the exception clauses, if you will, and I've heard some people say, well, I don't believe in the exception clauses, and I struggle with that because they are in our Bible. Same book. That God says, I hate divorce, is the same book. He gives some instructions for when it happens. Same book. And if you're here today and you're like, I, I'm not sure if I got remarried on the right grounds. I'm not sure if, look, if you're struggling with anything that you think might be a sin, confess it. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And if you're currently remarried, that doesn't mean I'll go get another divorce. I would no, no, be where you're at and ball out. Go all out on this one. So we're going to be together. I want God woven through this relationship. Because when separation occurs, a cord of three strands, if you're here today and you're even thinking, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. There's pain and cuts and hurt. But on top of that, I would encourage you to get around biblical counsel, get with our discipleship teams if there's a question 
about what you should do moving forward with your life. Because just because you might feel that it's unbound on earth, I would check with your heavenly father whether he has it unbound in his eyes. That's why scripture gives us some counsel. But I'm praying for new hearts, for every single marriage in here. And young people, I pray you have a marriage that has a humble heart on both sides. I love what the comedian Tim Hawkins says. He says, um, I love my wife so much that if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. (laughs) Ezekiel says this, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart. He's speaking this in light of a nation of Israel. He says, I want to make you love again. Ladies out there, Jesus loves you. You're his daughter. If you're a child of God, he loves you. If you're not a child of God, I got a relationship that is better than any other relationship you could ever pursue on earth. And that is one with your heavenly father but you're a child of God and he loves you and he wants to renew a heart in you. He might have to do some digging. It'll be morning by morning. There are times as families you go, we're not eating dinner enough together and it's kind of getting our family apart. Well, that doesn't mean you stop at Dunkin' Donuts and then right after Dunkin' Donuts, you go up to TGI Fridays and then right over to Red Robin and have seven meals out today. We're fixed. Back to Monday. No, 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 no. You can't spend that time growing apart and not have to slowly weave this back together. There ain't no quick fixes when there's pain. But God can do that. He can renew lives. And maybe, just maybe, that's why he's called you to renew to renew something in you and to stir that back up again. How do you do that? You begin by being joined together in the marriage you're in. We're going to do stuff together. I mean, we got to make money. It's Bucks County. I mean, I never see my wife, but it's a good job. Okay, but don't let that enemy laugh at you. He wants you to be together. I mean, it's one dinner. I mean, you know, guys and girls go out to dinner together. I'm not gonna go anywhere with my husband. I just go out to dinner. Okay, okay, but be careful. There's an enemy out there and he wants your marriage. You know why? Because he hates her and he hates you and he hates all of your children and he hates your brothers and sisters and he hates your parents and he hates your grandparents. And if he can throw a corkscrew into all of that, he's glad to do it. So watch out. We're called to love one another. Jesus says in the gospel of John, a new command I give you, love one another as I loved you, not as the world loves. The world thinks love is a noun. They think it's something they fall out of like a chair and fall into like a pool. I'm just not in love anymore. No, 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 no. You're using love like a noun. Love is a verb in scripture. Love is agape. Love is unconditional. Jesus would be a terrible marriage counselor if you're looking for a ton of empathy. I just don't love her anymore. Well, then start loving her. What do you mean? Take the word and make it a verb. No, no, it's a feeling. No, 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 that's what the world's teaching you. Don't take your cues from the world. Take it from me. Love her. How do you just take a word that's a noun and and make it a verb? You do it with Google. I just Googled that. Love him. Love her. Whether you've been divorced, whether you're remarried, love her, love him. I don't feel like it, do it. How? There's 59 one another, so I'm hoping to conquer some of them during our Christmas series I'm getting all excited about because I need some lighter topics, by the way. (laughs) Let me give you some as we leave. If you don't feel like it, husbands, out of your love for Jesus, serve her. Serve her. She doesn't deserve it. Serve her. Why should I? Because Jesus says, just like I loved you and serve you when you don't deserve it, I want you to do it for her. Ladies, they could go both ways. Consider one another first. 
but they don't deserve, you'll know what they did. Consider one another. Carry one another. Pray for one another. You want a marriage that lasts? Any young couples in here? Any 20-somethings? Guys, pray with her. And little pro tip, share what you love about her out loud. God, thank you for my wife. Thank you that she has done church basically by herself for the last 20 some years. But thank you for her sacrifice so her husband can preach the word of God. And you watch the body language. He's a pretty good guy after all, even though he forgot the trash again. (laughs) Because I'm verbing my love. Ladies, ladies, and we can do either side, guys and girls, bear with Bear with, us guys are very disappointing at times. We do know that. Bear with, because your marriage isn't about being happy. It's about being holy. And what you have bound on earth, God's saying, I'm gonna use that spouse to grow you closer to me. And isn't it funny? Sometimes the most difficult things in life are the things that grow us closer to Christ. What if your marriage is a renew story. Forgive, honor, encourage. I have biblical grounds to tell every marriage in this church that's what Jesus asks you to do. The picture. The president of my college, when I was, uh, at the time I was dating Rebecca, he would walk around the college going, where's my bride? Where's my bride? And we'd be like, why does he call her bride? She's like 84. (laughs) She's like, I'm coming. (laughs) And he's like, there's my bride. And he'd go up to the door of the car. He'd go there, come on. And and, and, and he would literally walk through the cab. Where's my bride? And those guys are like, bride. It wasn't until I had a chance to just sit in in a meeting that he was talking to leaders where he kind of, briefed us on that, my bride. Scripture says, rejoice in the bride of your youth. And he goes, that, that girl loves being called a bride even to this day. And I thought, there is a man that knows how to treat a woman, one. But there's a woman who sticks by her man And I like to get advice from couples who've been together for a long time. Pastor Doug and Julie, what do you think is one of the best things couples could do who have hit a really bad spot in their marriage? Well, what happens is communication is broke down. And we've often seen a heartfelt letter because conversation is too awkward goes a mile because they reread it and reread it, and reread it. Someone will have to choose the path of humility. But I want to encourage for everybody today, no matter what your marriage is currently like, God can redeem and take ashes and turn it into beauty. And I have watched countless kids who have gone through their parents having divorce, who love Jesus with all their heart and soul and mind. And God can redeem anything, amen? Amen. Ask him to do it.